Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India again and uh, we are going to deal with the section fourth of uh, the rural society uh, in terms of continuity and change and i think as we know that section fourth, fourth is dealing with the changing agrarian structure and the rural developmental concern in rural society and within that framework we already had uh, some discussion with regard to uh, how we try to understand the agrarian social structure we have also discussed about uh, the various uh, initiatives with regard to the rural development either it is in the form of cooperative uh, societies and also in terms of panchayatiraj institutions and uh, also we try to speak about the understanding of rural development so i think uh, uh, this is the flow in which we are trying to understand the changing agrarian structure and uh, what are the various rural development initiatives uh, which are going to be quite important so here uh, we are going to take up uh, uh what one can say 17th chapter that is on green revolution and land reforms in india i think uh, uh, this is a very significant uh, uh, topic in terms of uh, uh, trying to speak about the rural development in the real sense uh, it will highlight on the various aspects of green revolution and the various land reform initiatives uh, which are meant towards bringing about the structural transformation uh, and the wider implications of that on the rural society uh, that is going to be an important issue so we have to see uh, at the outset that what is green revolution and then gradually we will sink down to the history of land reforms access to the land reforms uh, common attributes of the land reforms and we will also try to speak about uh, uh, to some extent the failure of the land reforms in terms of its critique friends uh, somewhere we also try to see that uh, the sort of uh, an understanding with regard to the rural development has to be seen more with regard to the panchayati raj institutions uh, in terms of uh, economic uh, political democracy we have seen the cooperatives in terms of uh, uh, the so called uh, what you can say economic democracy and now we are trying to speak about uh, the reforms uh, which are to be seen with regard to the agrarian uh, structure in terms of uh, bringing about the development in the uh, production Uh, i think that is the uh, ultimate uh, which has to be seen uh, in terms of the real development and i think uh, uh, we can sometimes feel that uh, uh, green revolution is a, a mega project uh, which basically tries to incorporate uh, many things uh, which can be uh, thought of and uh, sometimes we can say that land reforms can be seen as uh, <coughs> one important aspect uh, uh, which is going to bring about uh, the sort of structural inequalities to end and uh, it was more towards the equitable justice and access to the land uh, which was considered to be an important source of earning for the rural india and that way we try to see that uh, the uh, reforms which has been done uh, with regard to the land in the form of uh, green revolution or land reforms are going to be ultimate uh, now let us try to see uh, what uh, comes into our mind when we try to speak about uh, the green revolution uh we try to see that uh, uh we can have uh, uh not the full evidences uh, but we may say that it can run from the early 1940s to 1970s and uh, although the periodization is bit unsatisfactory uh, but we try to see that uh, there are various processes of state reconfiguration uh, capitalist accumulation concentration of power uh, we have the agricultural investment innovations and which can be called uh, as the green revolution uh, in different senses and that way we can say that uh, either the green revolution can be seen as one form of land reforms in terms of enhancing uh, the productivity uh, that is going to be a significant issue and uh, we also try to see that uh, effectively we try to see the advent of land reforms by 1970s and uh, the green revolution by itself is seen as a moment in struggles around the creation of values altering the balance of class forces uh, reconfiguring the relations to the means of production 
and setting the processes of production and reproduction on the new trajectory. And we try to see that uh, uh, what the green revolution is and the seed of the revolution was planted in the early 1941 uh, when the Rockefeller foundation uh, sent a team to survey the Mexican agriculture. This resulted in the development of Mexican agricultural program uh, to which uh, in 1944 a young biologist uh, whose name was Norman Borlaug was, was hired. As a result of his dedication and ingenuity, he developed the miracle wheat in 1954, which was spread by the Rockefeller and the Ford Foundation uh, throughout the world in 1950s and 1960s uh, with other crops. And uh, we try to see that uh, Norman uh, Borlaug, he won the Nobel Prize for this initiative in 1970s and soon after we try to see that green revolution can be said to have come to an end. But I think uh, it is not appropriate to say like that. The idea of course, of course, is that he has tried his best to make a radical shift in the production system uh, with his initiative and that was the ultimate in which we try to say that it has come to an end when he re re <coughs> received the Nobel Prize. Uh, the term green revolution was coined by uh, William Gord, uh, G A U D. William Gord uh, late in the unfoldings at a meeting of the Society for International Development in uh, DC, Washington DC in 1968, in which he described what has happened as a result of the United States and philanthropic funding for the fertilizers, irrigations, improvement and the hybrid seeds. And that is how we try to see the uh, global history of the Green Revolution uh, which has occurred uh, with regard to the understanding of the Green Revolution. Uh, and to be more specific, uh, uh, quickly let us try to discuss about uh, what is the Green Revolution in India and how we can see <coughs> the trajectory of the Green Revolution in India. So, we try to see that uh, uh, since 1967, uh, when the high yielding variety seeds uh, that is HYVP uh, programs was been launched, uh, it has introduced into the Indian agriculture and uh, lot many things have been written about the Green Revolution. And uh, we may not be uh, erroneous to equate the green revolution with the high yield variety uh, program. So, the green revolution has to be understood more as a broader ideology of rural transformation, whereas the programs such as HYVP, integrated rural development programs and the others are specified for the inst institutionalized measures for translating the green revolution ideology into the practice. So, I think uh, we try to see that uh, these are certain programs uh, which are meant for uh, uh, what you can say uh, making it uh, more fast, uh, they were acting as a catalyst towards the green revolution. So, it is necessary to emphasize that green revolution uh, was seen as a package uh, and it was rather uh, a package in terms of an ideology and a program uh, and it is to be defined as a large scale application of modern science and technology to the agriculture. So, the green revolution technology involves the extensive use of the farm machinery or uh, hybrid uh, seeds energizing the well irrigation and use of the high fertilizer doses and pesticides and the other issues. And in short, we can say that it is an extensive and intensive use of improved production technology and high yielding variety of seeds, uh, which are seen as an essence of the green revolution. So, though with the differences of degree, the different parts of the rural, rural India have been uh, trying to see the developmental activities, but the initial measures for rural development in the form of community development program uh, which started in 1952, uh, the land reforms and also we have the cooperative institutions, all of these programs have been initiated from in the first two decades that is from 1947 to 1967 of the independence. And we try to see that uh, these aspects were basically meant for increasing the farm product farm uh, productivity and also in removing the uh, amount of uh, what i can say rural poverty unemployment and also uh, the ever growing socio economic inequalities in the rural countryside and that was the basic idea uh, in which these initiatives have been taken and that way if you try to see the green revolution was seen as the us sponsored technological package for agricultural development and was accepted in India uh, somewhat over enthusiastically 
and also uncritically because it was seen as uh, bringing a new ray of hope in terms of uh, uh, having the high yield of uh, production. So, it was hoped that with the improved farm production not only a lasting solution would be found for the perpetual problems of rural poverty and hunger, but it will also generate a new source, a resource base uh, for launching pad for the rural industrialization and that would create a new employment opportunities and would improve the quality of life at the grassroots uh, that is going to be important. So, the green revolution both in terms of theory and practice has been the dominant and also must talked about in terms of orientation for the rural development programs in India uh, and that had spread from uh, for nearly two decades since 1967. Meanwhile, we try to see that uh, to the mid term reviews of uh, the net outcome of the green revolution in the countryside uh, had been attempted uh, two uh, different ways uh, in early 1970s within just 5 years of the introduction of uh, high yield variety seeds and also in the later phase with certain other programs. So, we try to see that it was highlighted uh, that green revolution has both the positive and the negative aspect uh, in terms of the rural development. On the positive side, it was claimed that the impact of green revolution was visible in the food grain production uh, which has increased in India in the post hybrid uh, variety uh, program period and by 19.1 percent uh, over the pre hybrid uh, variety period that is from 1961 to 65. So, this increase was 87.2 percent uh, which was found in Punjab and 64.90 percent uh, in Haryana. Uh, where the grains in production performance was very impressive. Hence, some of the scholars believe that uh, to improve the backward regions in general, the agriculture in particular, there was no other alternative to the green revolution. But I think uh, that is not the true story for every uh, part of India. Uh, we also try to see that in the similar regions also, uh, we have many instances where uh, the uh, negative implications of the green revolution has also been seen. Uh, the regional variations in the agrarian social structure uh, in terms of land control and land use patterns, agroclimatic conditions and other socio-cultural as well as the historical specificities uh, can at least be partly accounted for bringing about new forms of inequalities in the rural India which has also been talked by a uh, few scholars. So, we try to see that uh, the so called green revolution has the mixed results and we try to see that it is difficult to defend a claim that such an exercise uh, should be seen as a value free uh, because somewhere it involves certain amount of critique uh, which has uh, reflected the negative shades of development. So, we have to be uh, objectively balanced to assess uh, what is right and what is wrong with the green revolution uh, that is going to be more important. So, we have to see the uh, not in terms of uh, quantity alone rather we have to uh, see the solution more in terms of quality also and that can be the right way in which we can understand the rural development strategies. So, initially the green revolution measures were considered as a scale neutral, uh, scale neutral meaning thereby that uh, <coughs> it will have uh, not have a different implications for la the large scale farming or the small scale farming. So, it will be scale neutral and it was therefore expected that whether it is the high yield variety seeds pesticides, insecticides and fertilizers or is the question of the lift irrigations, uh, we try to see that it is going to benefit both the small landholders as well as the large landholders, but it did not happen. Uh, the agriculture development bureaucracy working at the grassroots, uh, they had the different perceptions. Uh, they understand uh, and try to see the notion of scale neutrality and their action almost reflected that it was pro rich policy of the rural development. So, we somewhere try to see that uh, the initial understanding of the scale neutrality has been challenged and it was found that it is basically meant for the pro rich uh, peasantry only uh, like uh, John Mencher uh, who had uh, spoken uh, with regard to the uh, understanding of uh, the experiences from the Chingal Pet district of Tamil Nadu and he tried to find out that it was far from the neutral. Uh, what they thought was needed to further the green revolution was to forget about the small farmers. So, I think somewhere the small farmers has to be neglected off and uh, <coughs> it was basically going to give a boost to the uh, uh, rich farmers only that was one significant thing uh, that way I think it was trying to create a 
sort of a di divide uh, within the uh, rural India. Uh, also, we try to see that the national seed project started in India uh, with the World Bank assistance in 1976 as a part of green revolution measures and we try to find out that uh, the production and marketing of the high yield variety seeds uh, were basically meant for production in agriculture. But uh, we try to see that the actual implementation of these schemes uh, which has to be seen uh, <coughs> with regard to the green revolution are also been found uh, critically done. Especially we try to see that the policy underlying the project was to support the expansion of the private sector and to maintain a reasonable balance between the public and the private sector in agriculture. So, I think uh, somewhere uh, uh, green revolution was also a tilt towards uh, uh, the so called private sector and uh, thereby the public sector has to be sidelined. I think this is where uh, we try to see certain faults which, uh, faults which have been there with regard to the understanding of uh, the green revolution. So, virtually the pro rich peasant bias of the Indian rural development planning draws its justification from the fallacy that the green revolution technology being capital intensive suits the rich farmers much better than the small and the marginal farmers. Because the rich farmers atone has adequate resources to afford that technology of production and that expensive inputs are within the reach of only more affluent farmers therefore, it is not going to benefit all rather it is going to have a, a sectarian approach in terms of uh, its benefits and this assumption is then developed into an argument that uh, uh, we try to see that uh, it is basically uh, having a positive correlations with the farm size. So, higher is the farm size, higher is the benefit with regard to the green revolution and that is how we try to see uh, the negativity of uh, the green revolution. We try to see that uh, the rural inequalities uh, which begins to unfold their uh, unnoticed dimensions and gradually we try to see especially the issue of electricity connections uh, on the agricultural farms which start enhancing and suddenly there is a fluctuation in the uh, electricity bills and more uh, election electricity boards were to be uh, seen on the priority basis and that has basically led to the more utilization of the uh, electricity power. So, virtually we try to see that it has a negative implication in terms of uh, the sustainability uh, with regard to the uh, sustainability of the future generation that was another important thing uh, that we have to keep in mind. And also when we try to speak about uh, the green revolution in terms of mechanization of the farm operation, uh, we try to find out that uh, mechanization is not going to be effective or maybe within the reach of all the farmers. So, virtually the rich farmers could have uh, got the benefits out of the modernization of farm technology uh, which could not be done by many other peoples. Especially when we try to see uh, the misuse of uh, technology in terms of uh, uh, what I can say having certain amount of uh, 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 victimization uh, in the form of accidents uh, on the farm machines uh, that also had started happening. And we try to see that uh, in Punjab uh, the Workmen Compensation Act of 1923 uh, was been implemented, but it was not uh, taken seriously uh, in the instances of uh, the so called uh, accidents which are happening uh, because of the use of technology in the rural areas. So, that way I think uh, it has a bearing which has created another nuance, nuances in the countryside and the health hazards of the rural agricultural labor in the green re revolution belts are not confined to uh, seeing the re research in terms of the machine accidents. We also try to see that uh, uh, we have uh, the use of uh, increasing use of the poisonous chemical sprays for plant protection on the large scales, the high yielding variety of seeds uh, which were been seen as part and parcel of green revolution strategies are apparently highly susceptible to the disease. And we try to see that the overuse of the pesticides and the uh, so called uh, germicides have been there and that has created uh, a new forms of health hazards uh, and also it has a negative bearing on the agricultural labor. So, that way we try to see that uh, the aspects of land reforms uh, uh, in terms of the green revolutions uh, which were been thought of as bringing about uh, the new form of justice to the agriculture in terms of enhancement of the uh, uh, production uh, that also has carried certain negative implications which are going to be detrimental when we try to see uh, the sort of disasters which are going to come uh, in the future. And that way if you try to see 
uh, we try to find that uh, it has led to certain amount of prioritization with regard to the uh, green revolution technology package uh, because ultimately it has created a sort of a divide uh, which we try to see in terms of uh, the regional divides, the divides within the uh, rural <coughs> that also has happened and we also try to see that uh, the poorer has become poorer and the rich has become more rich. So, I think uh, the divide between the rich and poor has been created and we sometimes have seen that uh, the sort of green revolution has also implemented uh, to some extent the widening of the class dimension, uh, especially we try to see that the rural class has, uh, has not much uh, what you can say uh, uh, <coughs> wideness with regard to uh, the disparity, but because of the green revolution I think uh, the disparity has been enhanced and uh, they have also led to a certain amount of uh, uh, maybe uh, speaking about uh, the new forms of uh, uh, happenings uh, in the form of farmer suicides. Uh, basically, uh, we have uh, another important uh, calamity which has happened, uh, the sudden failure of uh, the crops uh, which has the higher investment uh, may ultimately lead to the farmer suicide. So, I think uh, we have to see that how uh, the green revolution has ultimately paid a weight for a new form of development uh, with regard to the rural India. Uh, we have uh, many doubts on that particular aspect, especially the scholars like Vanna Shiva. Uh, who was trying to uh, see things in a very different way uh, and trying to see that green revolution is going to be uh, against the nature uh, because the hybrid seeds are going to uh, distort the very essence of nature and that way we have to see that it involves certain amount of uh, blood uh, revolution uh, because ultimately it is going to uh, play with the nature and that is uh, where the bigger questions that comes into our mind and that has been reflected by Vanna Shiva and other scholars that how green is the green revolution, I think uh, that has to be taken seriously. So, I think uh, uh, this is one important segment uh, that we have to cater to when we try to speak about uh, the rural development especially in terms of the green revolution and uh, I think uh, uh, many scholars have worked on this particular issue and still I think uh, uh, the, the green revolution is, uh, uh, is on its uh, peak and we have to see that how uh, we can have the new forms of uh, uh, positive and the negative implications. Sometimes we try to see that uh, Punjab sometimes uh, has a, a train which has uh, which is normally be ca ca considered as uh, the cancer patient train and that is how we try to see the disaster uh, which was uh, not there earlier in the rural has been the part of rural also. So, that way I think uh, we try to see that uh, new forms of hazards are been created uh, because of the green revolution, but I think somewhere we have to see that uh, it should not be seen as a compromise uh, with regard to the uh, development alone, rather we have to see that we should adopt a med medium path whereby we can have the enhancement in the productivity, but it should not be at the cost of sustainability. Uh, but I think uh, beyond that I think uh, the most prominent issue uh, which we always see and look forward in terms of the rural development uh, and that catches the eyes of any social scientist is the issue of land reform and definitely that is going to be our <coughs> second section uh, of the discussion of this particular uh, <coughs> chapter. And uh, I think uh, when we try to speak about the land reforms many things comes into our mind especially the rural sociology basically studies the relations between the landowners, sharecroppers, laborers and above all the market system where the farm produce is exchanged and we try to see that uh, the unequal distribution of the land creates the sharp stratification in the society and on that Gunnar Middel uh, <coughs> has written in the Asian drama that inequality among the individuals is largely a question of land ownership and the rural income has been functionally related to that land holding the poor are more likely to be landless than the owning land. So, in a rural society land is the prime production and which determines the income, employment, status and authority of a person. And in any discussion on rural sociology the land tenure system and the land reforms I think they constitutes an important part of the study. And in this section definitely we are going to take up this particular issue that is the land reform in India. Now to begin with let us try to speak about the history of land reforms and we try to see that uh, 
uh, the land constitutes the concurrent list of our constitution of India. And uh, we also tried to find out that uh, uh, various attempts has been made in the history uh, to uh, which has basically spoken about the land reforms, uh, even uh, trying to speak about uh, the various uh, uh, present movement that we have studied in section 3, uh, where we have spoken about uh, uh, the Tebhaga movement, Telangana movement or it is the Naxalbari movement for that sake. Uh, we try to see that uh, most of the movements, even the uh, farmers movement, uh, they have certain uh, uh, what you can say concern for the land reforms uh, in either way. And that way we try to see that uh, land reform definitely is going to be an important uh, uh, critical issue uh, when we try to deal with the issue of the rural development. And uh, <coughs> I think uh, uh, Nehruji always has pronounced that when India will get freedom, land should be justifiably distributed. And that was the major concern and keeping that particular thing in mind, I think uh, in independent India, uh, the government has decided to abolish the system of zamindari, jagirdari in order to uh, remove the intermediaries uh, between the state and the peasant. And that is how we try to see that uh, uh, <coughs> the first leg legislation uh, that uh, came almost in all states in the early 1950s is also known as the abolition of the zamindari, jagirdari system act. And I think uh, uh, the land reforms made on the legislated uh, made uh, by the state government thus had an objective to make justifiable distribution of land and the removal of intermediaries. And what were the basic objectives behind this particular mission was uh, first of all to make a redistribution of land to achieve a socialistic pattern of society. I think that was the first important principle uh, of the land reform. And second was to enforce a land ceiling uh, and take away the surplus land uh, to be and to distribute it among the marginal and the landless peasants so that uh, everybody should have certain control and right over the land. The third thing is the to legitimize the agency uh, with the ceiling limits and that of course is I think going to be crucial because uh, it will be depending upon the uh, family size and although uh, it should not bring about certain amount of inequality or ingest with regard to the distribution of the land. Uh, we also try to see that uh, to register all the tenancy arrangements within the village panchayat is going to be crucial and finally to establish the relationship between the ceiling and the tenancy. So I think uh, these are certain things uh, uh, which has been taken into consideration uh, to see land reforms as an important principle for bringing about reforms in the society. And we basically try to see that uh, uh, the land reforms uh, uh, has been very successful uh, in most of the cases uh, to some extent and especially we try to speak about the state of Karnataka in 1970s and the West Bengal in 1980s and even we have uh, uh, the uh, case of uh, Jammu Kashmir where we have the uh, success uh, of the land distribution redistribution and we try to see that uh, uh, in the five year plan document also we try to acknowledge that uh, reducing inequalities in the land ownership has been the first priority uh, in most of the <coughs> rural development program and also in terms of the five year plans in the initial phase. So that way we try to see that uh, what is important is uh, how we are going to uh, pay uh, what you can say or understand uh, the land reforms. Especially we try to see it in terms of access to the land reforms as an important principle for the rural development. And we basically try to see uh, as P. C. Joshi has rightly suggested that there are three approaches to the land reform. First of course is the Gandhian approach, uh, second is the radical nationalistic approach and the third is the Marxist approach. So I think uh, land reforms can be seen in either of these forms. Uh, the Gandhian view does not bring out uh, directly in contradiction to the Indian rural societies and uh, <coughs> uh, it is just like what Vinoda Bhave has started a movement uh, known as the Gramdan movement. Uh, and this movement approached the landlords to party away with the surplus land uh, based on appeal uh, in the form of donations and that is how the landless uh, should get the land. So uh, this is where we try to see that uh, the approach of Gandhian uh, model was been taken up. Uh, second was definitely the radical nationalist uh, which turned out to be the formal approach to be adopted by the state government and which has been taken care in various states. And lastly, we have the Marxist approach uh, which takes into account uh, which I just shared that is the formation of the various present movement like we try to see 
uh, either it's the Naxalbari uh, movement or the Tebhaga movement or we try to see certain other movement. Uh, Telangana also we have the impressions of uh, the Marxist approach, uh, especially we have the role of CPI, uh, Communist Party of India, uh, which had played a crucial role with regard to uh, bringing about certain amount of justice with regard to the land distribution. So, we try to see that uh, uh, various aspects have been taken into consideration, at least uh, <coughs> all the three approaches uh, more or less were viable and they have been uh, having its practicality when we try to see about the land reforms in India uh, as has been talked about by P. C. Joshi. And uh, then we try to see that uh, what were the common attributes uh, uh, which were required, especially when we try to speak about the land reforms. As I said earlier also that abolition of the intermediaries uh, that has been the important concern uh, which has to be taken seriously. And for that I think um, since we know that uh, before independence the uh, rural India has been seen as having the four tenancy system in the country. The first one is the Royatwari system, uh, second is the Mahalwari system, uh, third is the Zamindari system and the fourth is the Jagirdari system. So, I think uh, if you try to see that uh, sometimes these systems were found in uh, different regions and sometimes within one state also we try to find uh, that uh, these things were available. So, like uh, we try to speak about the Royatwari system, uh, this is a kind of land tenancy which was first introduced in British in Madras uh, <coughs> by British in Madras in 1772 and later on it was extended to the Bombay presidency. And under this tenancy system, every registered holders of the land was recognized as the proprietor and he was to pay revenue directly to the government. Then in the Mahalwari, uh, it was seen as a kind of tenancy uh, which was introduced during the British rule and it was first started in the area of Agra and Awadh and was later on extended to Punjab. And here the land was held jointly by co-sharing uh, bodies of the village communities and this body was treated as jointly and severely liable for paying the land revenue. So, the Mahalwari system was there, then we have the Zamindari system and yeah, <coughs> this system was basically prevalent in uh, Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, Bombay presidencies and in Tamil Nadu. And under this system, uh, one or more person owned the village and they were responsible for the payment of revenue to the state. And uh, that is how we try to see that Britishers have appointed uh, this uh, system uh, to have the gains from the land and it was basically seen as one of the most exploitative system uh, which whereby the absentee landlords have been encouraged and uh, the actual tillers uh, they were under the fear of ejection from the land and sometimes the over exploitation of the <coughs> peasantry has been there uh, because of the zamindari system. And finally, we have the Jagirdari system and the Jagirdari tenancy system was found basically in the princely state of Rajasthan and uh, we try to see that uh, in Rajasthan the Jagirs were granted to certain military commanders, uh, ministers and the corps who took the revenue for their own support or for the military force and which they were obliged to maintain in terms of generating the revenue. So, this is how we try to see that the Jagirdari system was created as a class of unproductive mass of people by granting them certain Jagir lands. But however, uh, with the Rajasthan Jagir Jagirdari Abolition Act which was passed in 1952 uh, <coughs> and finally implemented in 1954, we try to see that the Jagirdari, Jagirdari tenancy system in Rajasthan has ended. So, I think uh, uh, sooner or later after independence. Uh, these sort of land revenue systems which were been prevailing in uh, the <coughs> rural India, especially in terms of uh, uh, what you can say the issue of uh, uh, inequity with regard to the control over the land. So, I think uh, soon after the independence, uh, the government of India has taken serious initiatives to overcome these intermediaries and putting uh, back the peasantry into the mainstream. Uh, but I, as I discussed that uh, beyond that, uh, what was required further is also a significant issue of land sealing. So, I think uh, land sealing was another important component of uh, the land reforms uh, which was basically required when we try to speak about uh, uh, the reforms with regard to the distribution of the land. So, the basic objective of the land reform was to remove or minimize the unequal distribution of the land that of course, is the basic motto 
and the land sealing was seen as one important measure to take away the surplus land from those who cross the limits of land possessions beyond a certain point. So, the sealing limit of land was imposed on the uh, <coughs> following groups. First was land is a source of income. So, basically we try to see uh, either it is the question of uh, <coughs> the laborer, marginal farmers or small farmers, they have to be granted certain amount of land. So, the land ceiling limit was uh, applying to these groups who did not have a land and they should be given certain lands. Second important aspect was the land ceiling should be imposed on variety of lands, especially uh, the fallow land, uncultivable lands, cultivable lands and the irrigated land. In all these categories of lands, there is a uh, requirement for the ceiling. Uh, third of course, is ceiling on the irrigated and the two crop land that is another important issue depending upon the uh, irrigated sources and also if uh, in one uh, land more than one crops are being sold. So, there also the ceiling has to be different and then uh, we also try to see that uh, ceiling up to 54 acres. I think uh, that was something which was been uh, standardized uh, consisting of different types of land. So, the total holding after the best categories of land uh, into the lowest category is up to 54 acres. So, I think uh, these are certain uh, things uh, which has been enacted uh, through the land ceiling act and <coughs> the basic purpose of the uh, <coughs> act was that a family of five members has been taken as a unit including the husband, wife and their three minor children and provision has been kept for additional member of the family, but not exceeding twice the ceiling limit. Uh, second was where both the husband and the wife hold the land in their own names, the two will have the right in the properties within the ceiling in proportion to the value of the land uh, in terms of their control. And the third is that each major child is treated as a separate unit for the purpose of application of ceiling. So, I think uh, these are certain things uh, which has been kept in mind, but ceiling limit had certain exemptions uh, like uh, we try to see that uh, the exemptions were in favor of plantation of tea, coffee, uh, rubber and cocoa that they were exempted from uh, the ceiling limits. And also we have exemption in terms of industrial and the commercial undertakings that was also exempted. And also we try to see the exemptions of sugarcane factories are permitted to own land up to 100 acres. So, somewhere we try to see that ceiling limit uh, does not incorporate all the things which are to be cultivated, rather it has to depend upon the nature of land, it has to depend upon the nature of crop and also on the requirement of the family. And sometimes it has a variation from state to state, like uh, in the state of Andhra Pradesh, the ceiling limit for irrigated land was 10 to 18 acres and in West Bengal it was 12.4 acres. Similarly, for Haryana, it was 17 <coughs> upon 9 acres and in Karnataka, it was 10.13 acres. So, I think uh, every state have their own geographical uh, viability and accordingly, the ceiling limit has its own variation. But the basic idea of course, is that the practice should be made in such a fashion, so that the so called uh, <coughs> ceiling has to be made uh, comfortable uh, with the people and they should be in a position to speak about certain amount of uh, uh, reforms with regard to uh, the land and uh, proper utilization of the land has to take place. So, virtually we try to see that uh, the land positions and the social power uh, which were seen as an important issue uh, for maintaining the control over the land uh, becomes an important issue. And the agenda of land reform as we have discussed was basically for abolition of intermediaries and the land ceiling was to be implemented effectively. Uh, Walter Fernandez has rightly said that any asp an aspect that needs to be borne in mind in order to understand uh, this apparent contradiction is that land is not merely a source of cultivation or building as it is made out of the most legislation. Its ownership pattern in an agrarian economy is a sign of person's social status. I think uh, that is what makes the things uh, uh, more uh, drastic and uh, we try to see that legitimation of tenancy within the ceiling, ceiling limit was seen as an important principle uh, to make the things more effective and viable and uh, it should has to be seen in terms of uh, uh, having certain amount of control uh, by the village panchayat and the village panchayat was been empowered to have 
the implementation of uh, the land reform legislation and to have the registration of all the tenancy arrangements uh, within the village panchayat domain. And uh, I think uh, we try to see that uh, these initiatives which have been done, uh, they have their own purposes, especially when we try to speak about the land reforms, we try to see that uh, it is not a magical uh, node in which at one go we can have all the reforms. So, I think uh, land reforms have been seen in phases, uh, especially when we try to see the different state, every state have their own experiences with regard to the implementation of uh, land reforms and especially we try to also see that uh, in many instances we try to find that uh, there was also the failure of land reforms. And uh, somewhere we have to see that uh, what has resulted into the uh, failure uh, that becomes an important issue. Uh, basically we try to see that uh, the reforms were basically meant for bringing and bridging the relationship between the man and the land and between the tillers of the land and the other beneficiaries uh, that is going to be an important issue. And uh, we basically try to see that uh, <coughs> the Indian society uh, which was considered to be heterogeneous in terms of uh, the distribution of land and also in terms of geography. And we have all shades of uh, 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 people in terms of big farmers, sharecroppers, agricultural laborers across the states and they have their own way of uh, looking to their own interest uh, in terms of agricultural production. So, virtually we try to see that uh, when we try to speak about uh, the land reforms uh, which are to be uh, introduced uh, in an effective way, uh, we try to see that uh, certain flaws has always been there uh, when we try to see its effective implementation. And the reasons can be many, but I think uh, if we just try to map it down in terms of the major reasons uh, which are seen as a critique of the land reforms, uh, why we can say that the tenancy relations and the land reforms legislations have failed, uh, what were the basic uh, uh, what you can say issues uh, which we have to take into consideration. Uh, I think first important thing that uh, we have to think seriously is the issue of increasing land inequality. I think that of course is one important thing that makes the things more troublesome, especially when we try to speak about uh, the uh, sort of reforms in terms of distribution of land. We try to say that uh, every state have their own diversity and we try to also see that uh, the amount of inequality in terms of land ownership uh, across the state uh, uh, was huge. And we try to see that uh, as we have shared earlier that <coughs> different states have the different mode of revenue system. And that way if we try to see, uh, we try to find out that uh, the state was uh, not in a position and sometimes they were not willing also uh, uh, in a pressure to have certain amount of equity with regard to the distribution of land. And that way I think uh, somewhere uh, it involves the political will which is the most essential part uh, to have the effective implementation of the land reforms. So, we try to see that uh, uh, the inequality which has been there across in terms of the big farmers and the small farmers uh, that has to be taken seriously. We also have to see another important aspect that is the state uh, was trying to support the big farmers. I think uh, uh, this is bit ironical uh, to say, but uh, somewhere we try to say that state, uh, the state machinery in terms of bureaucracy, sometimes they were going along with the uh, big farmers and landlords. I think that was another important reasons which has led to the failure of the land reforms uh, in the country. And we try to speak about and that has been emphasized by uh, NC Saxena uh, in one of his uh, recommendation that uh, the failure of land reform has been uh, because of uh, the state intervention uh, in support of the big farmers. And that sometimes has led to certain amount of prejudice with regard to the equitable <coughs> uh, distribution of the uh, justice of land and uh, where the small farmers have been uh, suffering a lot. Then also we try to see that the big farmer corner the land of marginal farmers. I think uh, this is another uh, drastic thing uh, which has happened. Uh, basically we try to see that smaller patches of the land cannot be operated uh, uh, for agriculture and what happened of course is after the land sealing, uh, <coughs> the land was which was been given to the beneficiaries uh, to the marginal farmers. Uh, they were scattered in nature, sometimes the quality of land was not proper. So, virtually the big farmers uh, had taken the best uh, at their own end and the 
after the land sealing the remaining land which was to be distributed uh, was having uh, the various flaws. So, I think uh, that is another important reasons which makes even the distribution of the redistribution of the land uh, not very viable. Uh, similarly, we try to see that surplus land which was been surrendered or which was been identified for distribution sometimes it was seen as a fallow land or it was an uncultivable land that was another important tyranny which we try to see is going to be crucial. So, I think uh, that way we try to see that uh, if the uh, <coughs> poor peasant uh, or the landless peasant they have got the land it was barren in nature sometimes it was not fit for cultivation and that sometimes was uh, good for nothing and that is how we try to see that land reform uh, if it has been done in terms of redistribution could not have been done very effective. And another important issue that uh, we have to see is basically the issue of Benami transaction. I think uh, Benami transaction was an important uh, phenomenon which was happening and we try to see that uh, the land possessed in excess of the land ceiling was been ad adjusted against the Benami person. So, sometimes it was in the name of somebody else, in the name of relatives or in the name of distant uh, uh, neighborhood and that is how the land uh, ex exact land was been hided and such Benami transaction do not make any change in the operational aspect of the agriculture and virtually we try to find out that uh, uh, these Benami transactions were again into the hands of the big landlords and that way I think the basic purpose of uh, the land reform was defeated that is to extract the excessive land from the uh, uh, big uh, farmers or big landlords I think uh, that to some extent was defeated with the uh, process of Benami transaction. And finally, we can say that the lack of political will I think uh, lack of political will was uh, one important issue as I we have shared earlier that uh, <coughs> the political parties uh, uh, who were basically part and parcel of the former Jagidari and Zamindari systems and uh, uh, they were not in a position uh, to have the quick implementation of uh, uh, the land <coughs> initiatives uh, like we try to see that uh, in various states we try to find out that uh, successful cases uh, were been thought of, but the outcome was not very ripe. And we try to see that uh, uh, the states like uh, Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and Haryana, uh, they did not have shown uh, much rigorous land reforms. Uh, basically, uh, the political will has sometimes we found uh, to be less suitable uh, to care for the needs of uh, the so called uh, uh, <coughs> marginal and the small farmers. So, that way we try to see that uh, land reforms initiatives which have been there at the different level. I think uh, that is going to be quite significant, but more important is that how or to what extent we are in a position to actually speak about uh, uh, the sort of land distribution uh, that is going to be an important issue. Uh, like here for uh, just clarification of an example, if I just try to see uh, take the state of Jammu Kashmir uh, which uh, somewhere I try to work upon in terms of uh, 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 seeing the amount of uh, land reforms which took place. Uh, I think uh, uh, many instances have been there, uh, we try to see that uh, it was considered to be one of the prominent state uh, which has uh, uh, taken away the land surplus land and it did not pay the compensation to the land owners. I think uh, uh, this is where we try to see the strength of the land reforms in Jammu Kashmir. Uh, but more important is that uh, when we try to see it in terms of its effectiveness, uh, I think uh, because of the geographical location or sometimes because of the uh, sort of trouble uh, in the state because of the governance, uh, sometimes we do not find that the outcome of the land reforms was found very successful. And I think uh, many instances have been there whereby uh, the true uh, what you can say uh, owners uh, who were big landlords or sometimes they were basically uh, having uh, the <coughs> uh, chunk of lands, I think they could not be uh, controlled because of the land reforms in Jammu Kashmir. Like uh, one uh, important aspect was that uh, orchards uh, uh, especially in the Kashmir uh, the orchards uh, basically the uh, apple orchards uh, and the fruit orchards uh, which have been there I think uh, they were beyond the control of over, over the land uh, reforms. So, uh, many people they have showed their land as the orchards and I think uh, these were the peoples who were basically having 
uh, I think uh, uh, multiple uh, lands and uh, uh, they had a huge uh, amount of uh, surplus uh, lands, but uh, because in the name of the uh, orchard sometimes they have been excused from uh, uh, donating or surrendering their land and that is where we sometimes find out that uh, the basic purpose of land reform was to bridge the inequality which has been there with regard to the uh, land holding. I think uh, that could not be sustained and that is where we try to see that certain <coughs> flaws has been created. And also uh, we try to find out that many times it was been found that uh, in certain instances uh, like uh, Operation Barga in West Bengal that was again considered to be one of the successful case. Uh, similarly, like Karnataka also was seen as one of the uh, successful state in terms of land reforms. So, I think uh, many measures have been uh, there uh, to bring about uh, the sort of uh, reforms with regard to the distribution of the land. Uh, on an average, if you try to see uh, the basic outcome in terms of the reforms, uh, we try to find out that uh, the attempt was basically meant for initially meant for having the abolition of intermediaries that was one significant thing uh, which has been highlighted across the state. In most of the state I think uh, land reform was been done by uh, removing the intermediaries that was one important thing. Uh, second which we can say is uh, the implementation of the ceiling act. I think uh, the implementation of the ceiling act was another important thing uh, which we have to take it uh, seriously. And uh, that was one important way in which uh, the land reforms were being implemented in uh, various states. And the third thing in that sense if you try to see uh, somewhere we try to find out that the third important thing was basically to see that uh, the surplus land uh, has to be uh, distributed uh, to the uh, so called uh, what you can say <coughs> marginal farmers and the landless uh, uh, peasantry. So, I think uh, that was one initiative which was been made. But ultimately we try to see that uh, these sort of initiatives uh, which has been done across the state uh, they were not uniform in nature. And uh, I think uh, as we shared that uh, sometimes uh, the uh, <coughs> parameters on which we try to say that uh, uh, the critics had been raised that why land reforms have been failure on various grounds. So, I think uh, across the states uh, there are different reasons uh, which has motivated uh, for not implementing the successful uh, land reforms. So, I think uh, these are certain things uh, that we have to keep in mind, but I think the story of the land reform should not stop here. I think uh, as we can share uh, which we try, try to speak in the earlier phase uh, of this uh, uh, deliberation that uh, green revolution definitely uh, is an important tool. And uh, that way we can say that one aspect of land reform can be the green revolution, because uh, green revolution also uh, is one form of land reform. Uh, that we have to see uh, because ultimately it is also going to enhance the productivity, uh, the quality of land has to be enhanced. So, I think uh, that can be seen as one important way in which the land reform has to be seen. And uh, I think the basic idea which we have to keep in mind of course is that uh, the successful green revolution definitely can pave a way for uh, the effective uh, <coughs> productivity and that is another important component of, of land reform to enhance the uh, uh, productivity of uh, crops. And then I think uh, now we can see another shade of land reforms which is happening uh, especially when we try to speak about uh, uh, the sort of consolidation of land. I think that is going to be an important issue that consolidation of land has to take place uh, in order to make uh, the effective use of the land. And beyond that I think uh, uh, certain other things uh, which are basically been done and are been required to be taken are. Uh, like uh, we are now speaking about the digitalization of the land. Now, the digitalization and computerization of the land records uh, <coughs> that are been done by various states. Again, I think uh, Karnataka definitely has played a crucial role with regard to maintaining the digitalization of uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, or of the land records. And I think uh, NIC uh, that way is doing an effective way to have all the land records into the computerized form. And I think uh, this is one way in which we can have certain control over the land in terms of uh, 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 who is the owner, uh, how much is the land and everything can be assessed at any corner of the country. And that is I think uh, another successful way in which we have to see that land reform initiatives has to be taken. And then I think uh, if we have to really go further, I think what is required in that sense of course is certain land reform initiatives has to be seen in terms of 
having certain amount of cooperatives uh, uh, with regard to the land. I think that is another important issue which uh, we have to take up seriously, especially when we try to speak about uh, the land reforms with regard to having certain amount of uh, common ventures. Uh, I think that is going to be another important issue. Further, I think uh, land reforms has to be seen in terms of uh, the effective use of that land uh, which is normally considered as the wasteland. I am basically referring to uh, the land uh, which is uh, not arable, uh, which is not utilized. I think uh, they have to be taken into consideration, especially the lands uh, uh, which are with regard to the tribals, uh, the tribal population which is unable to utilize the effective land. I think uh, that is the way in which we can have further land reforms uh, by having the uh, justifiable access to the land resources, especially the proper use of the land. Uh, that is going to be more important. So, I think uh, the basic principle which is involved for the land reform involves a certain amount of uh, equity with regard to the land uh, that is going to be an important issue. But more than that, what is important is that how it has to be successfully implemented and that is where uh, I think uh, the crux of the uh, rural development lies because land uh, for all practical reason is going to be uh, very sound in terms of uh, uh, not only as an economic source, but it is also seen as a status symbol for many. And that is how we have to see that if we have the proper distribution of the land in an effective way, uh, we can actually speak about uh, the proper utilization of the land. So, uh, friends, I think uh, these are certain things that we have to keep in mind. And I think uh, plenty of material are available uh, when we try to speak uh, on the issue of green revolution. Uh, like uh, we can speak about uh, the green revolution as I have suggested earlier, uh, we can have the contribution by uh, D. N. Dhanagre that is going to be an important issue. Uh, he has worked on agrarian reforms and the rural development in India uh, that is going to be quite significant. Many economists has worked on uh, the green revolution uh, like uh, uh, G. S. Bhalla and G. K. Chadda who had worked extensively on the green revolution and the small peasants. Uh, then also we try to speak about the contribution of Vanda Shiva uh, who tries to see the green revolution in a very different framework and now we are trying to see the critique of uh, uh, the green revolution. And uh, uh, since uh, most of our discussion uh, is uh, uh, based on uh, the readings of uh, these works and uh, that way we try to see that uh, uh, how we can have the better understanding about uh, the green revolution from the uh, recent resources. Uh, we have a wonderful work uh, which can be seen uh, by Patel uh, who has extensively worked on the modern yeah, postmodern understanding about the green revolution. And that way we say that uh, <coughs> Patel Raj, I think Raj Patel has uh, significantly worked upon uh, this particular issue and that also has to be taken into consideration when we try to see the effect of green revolution across the world. And uh, these are I think certain ways in which we can equip ourselves for uh, better understanding about uh, the rural development with regard to the green revolution. And on the issue of land reforms, I think uh, uh, <coughs> one sizable thing uh, which is always available is I think uh, the SAGE has come out uh, with the volumes on land reforms in India. And uh, uh, it is basically divided into uh, <coughs> 12 volumes uh, which tries to cover up I think. Uh, uh, I will not say the entire states, but majority of the states are been covered and that is basically a mega uh, what you can say project and survey which has been done by <coughs> Lal Bahadur Shastri Institute Masuri. And that way I think a uh, lot many bureaucrats and uh, uh, <coughs> the academicians are involved with regard to uh, finding out the effective uh, measures which have been taken for land reforms across the states. So, I think uh, that is a handy volume that one has to read. And beyond that, I think uh, the contribution by uh, P. C. Joshi on land reforms in India and then we have I think D. R. Gadgil and many other scholars who have extensively worked on P. S. Appu's contribution is on uh, land reforms in India. Uh, S. C. Dubey has uh, worked extensively on that. We have uh, the contribution of A. R. Desai, uh, uh, his sizable volume on uh, uh, the rural sociology in India. I think extensive literature is available. And of recent, I think uh, Paramjit Singh Judge has worked uh, with regard to land reforms in uh, <coughs> the state of Punjab. So, I think uh, we try to see across the states, uh, we have specific case studies which tries to speak about the land reforms in general. And that is the way in which we have to effectively uh, understand and uh, relate it 
uh, with the uh, updated knowledge about the landforms. So, friends, I think uh, these are the things which I wanted to share. Uh, the basic idea definitely is to uh, promote and uh, inculcate in your minds uh, that how and in what forms the rural society has been transformed. Uh, what is required at your end of course is you have to update uh, your knowledge about these issues to make it more effective and that is the way in which the purpose of this uh, course has to be uh, solved, uh, resolved in terms of having the effective knowledge about uh, our grassroots society and this is where we have to really learn ourselves and we have to unlearn what is happening, the ground experiences that we have to tap and on the basis of that we have to have the further readings about the rural society. So, I think uh, that is all for the discussion on this topic on green devolution and land reforms and I think uh, we will meet uh, on uh, other lectures on the contemporary issues with regard to the land reforms initiatives as well as with regard to the green revolution in general and of course, trying to speak about the rural development in India. Thank you once again.